Welcome. My name is Matt Rajansky, and I'm the director of the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute. Thank you all for joining us today for our event, Achievements and Failures of Zelensky's Presidency at its Midpoint. Before we start, I want to remind uh, those who are interested to stay up to date with our upcoming events and publications on our website, as well as our podcasts, Kennan X and the Russia File. You can also read our latest uh, analysis of events in Russia and the region on the Russia File and Focus Ukraine blogs. Uh, next week, we'll be jointly hosting with Penn America, Ukrainian novelist and journalist Stanislav Aseyev, uh, as well as co-founder of the Media Initiative for Human Rights, Maria Tomak, for an event entitled Illegal Detentions and Human Rights Issues in Eastern Ukraine, a conversation with Stanislav Aseyev. So please join us for that conversation at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday, November 23rd. Uh, during today's event, if you, look, you can submit it via email to Kenan, K-E-N-N-A-N, at wilsoncenter.org, via Twitter, at Kenan Institute, or on our Facebook page. Please include your name and affiliation when you're sending questions. Um, I'm going to begin by introducing uh, our first panelist. I'm then going to let him speak and then introduce each of our uh, panelists before they speak. Uh, we should have plenty of time today for discussion. Uh, like I said, I encourage all of you to submit questions. The topic is, you know, always timely, as we were joking with some of the panelists before the event. Uh, there's always a full employment plan for analysis in Ukraine. There's always something that needs discussion and analysis. But in particular now, as we look at uh, midway point in the Zelensky presidency, it is an appropriate time to take stock of the promises that were made, of the initiatives that were launched, and the success, or in some cases, failure. And we, we did use that word in announcing this event, even though I understand it's a loaded word. Um, so I'll ask our panelists to justify it, if they're going to say there's, there's failure, um, uh, of that presidency. Where do we stand? What has been successful and, and what has not? And to start off our conversation, uh, talking about political developments uh, in uh, the Zelensky presidency, uh, Vasil Filipchuk. Uh, who, as many of you will know, is a top-ranked expert in foreign policy and European issues in Ukraine, uh, a well-known analyst, participant in Chatham House and Wilton Park events, uh, an experienced diplomat and author of Euro Ukraine's European Integration Strategy, uh, approved by presidential decree in 1998. Mr. Filipchuk has served as spokesman for Ukraine's foreign ministry, director of the political department of the foreign ministry, director of the EU Integration Department, at the Secretariat of the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine. Uh, has a, he has the rank, uh, the third civil service rank and the envoy uh, extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary uh, rank as a diplomat of the second class. So without further ado, Basile, uh, much more interesting than the elaborate diplomatic titles is everything you have to say, please. Thank you, Matt. It's a great pleasure to be with all of you. And uh, when you prepare um, a presentation about uh, results of someone's political um, uh, career or some processes. It's always interesting to see what you thought about the subject some years before. So I have taken my uh, presentation of March uh, 2019 to look what Zelensky promised uh, two and a half years ago. And it's, it's really funny to see what he promised what has been achieved, uh, was ha what has been failed. Of course, everything is relative, what can be assessed as an electoral promise uh, or what was just a populist uh, statement. But overall, uh, I remember, I, I just found that we, we counted uh, 34 pre-electoral promises of Zelensky. And if you take everything what he said before and immediately after elections, it can be 647 pre- and post-electoral promises. Uh, we made our own calculation at ICPS with our experts, and but just by just arithmetical um, approach, 27% of his uh, pre-electoral promises were fulfilled. Also, we looked at some other analytical centers and media calculations, and we were surprised that they also come to the same assessment. 25, 28% of his promises uh, were achieved. But of course, it's very artificial and doesn't reflect really uh, all the achievements and failures of Zelensky. So I decided not to look at very uh, simple uh, populist uh, promises like I will sell presidential dacha. 
or residence. <laughs> it was a huge scandal in this country when President Zelensky moved from his uh, house to presidential dacha, which he promised to sell. He promised to sell all presidential planes, and we see that he is using them in the same way as, as previous one. Uh, and, and actually, should we should we assess uh, this type of promises as serious ones on which we have to uh, judge on his um, successful or, or failed presidency? Certainly not. We should take some serious uh, issues and base on serious social, uh, political, economic processes to assess was it uh, success or failure uh, first two and a half years of President Zelensky in office. So after uh, organizing uh, uh, my presentation in more structured way, I uh, decided to give uh, three examples of each of achievements, half achievements and failures of Zelensky, which really gives us uh, more or less objective uh, 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 vision of what uh, he achieved. So. Uh, my general conclusion is that it was all not as bad as it could be, but not as good as we all expected. Some achievements took place. For example, digitalization. It's a matter of fact that we all are now uh, using DIA uh, app, which really provides a very convenient uh, digital services starting from COVID up to passport. But should we assess this as a reform or just as a very successful service introduced by state? I'm afraid it's not really reform. It's very, it's very convenient, very helpful um, uh, service uh, by the state, which does, which has not really changed the way how the state functions. Second uh, achievement, which we should uh, really uh, accept, it's road construction. Roads has been always one of the biggest problems of this country, citizens, uh, which uh, we have been facing every day. And as active driver, I've been always uh, able to, 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 to uh, witness myself a situation with our roads. And we have to confess over the last two years, uh, some uh, good uh, improvements of our quality of our roads uh, took place and construction takes place. Has it changed the way how Ukraine statehood functions? No. Has it been an uh, infrastructural uh, project which generated thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs? No. But as a way uh, how state provides services to people, yes, it has been a good, good step forward. Third uh, achievement, land market. We have been one of very few countries uh, with uh, prohibition of selling, buying uh, uh, land, uh, agricultural land. And finally, it has been settled by Verkhovna Rada uh, with President Zelensky uh, uh, pressure and motivation. Has it really changed the way how Ukrainian ag agriculture or society has been organized? Has it made really uh, um, enormous uh, um, uh, impetus on the way how Ukrainian economy works? No, it has not. But we should we should acknowledge, yes, at least these three serious achievements uh, has taken place. Then we come to more serious issues, where uh, whatever you take, uh, even if you acknowledge its success, then you have a number of different uh, comments which neglect uh, successfulness of this achievement or failure. For example, ceasefire. I would, uh, if it was one year ago, I would put it as number one um, achievement. At the end of the day, President Zelensky has always been, first of all, elected as a president of peace. As we remember, Poroshenko was a president of war, Zelensky was president of peace. Yes, introduction of ceasefire was long awaited and huge success. However, without number of uh, elements, without significant political will, it just it was just a first step. And if there were no further step to uh, transform ceasefire into uh, stable peace, then this ceasefire has been always uh, under threat of being uh, destroyed by uh, spoilers, by interested parties, and so on. So I just looked at the OEC Special Monitoring Mission report. We have been witnessing since uh, 2020 step-by-step uh, -step worsening of the situation. If we had 600 ceasefire violations, 
last year per month, end of last year, 2,800 per month. And can you imagine, we have now 250 ceasefire violations per day. So uh, last week we had 800 violations per day. So do we still have ceasefire or not? It's a big question. Without political will of transforming ceasefire into peace, without diplomatic uh, efforts, it would not come. Uh, Crimea. On one side, yes, it's a huge success. Crimea is back to agenda. Uh, however, was Crimean platform real success? Uh, without vision of how Crimean issue should be accepted by Russian side as an uh, issue on our agenda, it basically just yet another PR. Uh, or if we come to internal politics, uh, Zelensky promised to remove parliamentary immunity. It has been in promises of many, many uh, parties, many, many candidates for presidency for many, many years. Finally, we see it has been removed. Has it changed Ukraine democracy to the better? Actually, from the very beginning, all these promises to remove presidential uh, parliamentary immunity, immunity of uh, deputies from prosecution was very questionable promise. Now we see that, for example, last week, very arrogant uh, statement and action of one of our deputies, uh, those who follow Ukrainian politics know uh, that I mean Gail Leros, a, a very anti-presidential member of parliament who uh, addressed pre president in a very arrogant way. Now a criminal case has been opened against him with explanations that it's uh, because he insulted the president in order to build up his political image. Come on, is it a reason to prosecute deputies that they want to insult other politicians to build up their own political image? You can, in, in, in such a way, you can imprison half of uh, parliamentarians or even absolute majority of parliamentarians in any parliament of the world because it's, it's what politics is. So is it success or not success? Difficult to say, I would say that it's more, it's more uh, populist, populist promises. Uh, when they uh, come to reality, they, they become not so attractive and not so positive. Then if you come to failures of President Zelensky, uh, here we face real serious issues. First of all, peace. Uh, President Zelensky was elected as president of peace and he really failed to deliver any significant peace plan. He had all the possibilities first three, six months of his presidency to do whatever he wanted with Minsk agreement, uh, to do whatever he wanted with Budapest memorandum. Politician who got 73% of public support could easily say, I will not fulfill Minsk, full stop. It's impossible to fulfill. It was wrongly prepared. It has no credibility. I refuse. And leaders of other states had to deal with this. But when he says this two years after uh, promises that he would implement means, well, obviously, it's not sustainable. Uh, being a, 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 a Dow at the beginning of his campaign, he became a hawk compared to whom Poroshenko is not hawk anymore. He is now in his rhetoric, uh, Poroshenko heart version with no really chance to see any sustainable peace plan uh, for, for settlement of conflict on Donbass, returning Crimea and developing modus vivendi with Russia. End of era of poverty. Uh, it was a promise which really people believed Zelensky would, would do something. And at the beginning, he yes, increased uh, minimal wage. He promised to decrease uh, tariffs. Of course, it was impossible to do. Now we can uh, conclude there was no model, no understanding, no vision of how to end era of poverty. I can give you uh, data of GDP per capita. If before uh, Maidan we had $4,000 per capita, now we have 3,700. And with two, three percent of GDP growth, era of poverty would last, uh, I'm afraid, many, many decades. Uh, then the last, the biggest failure is fight against oligarchs and corruption. Yes, we expected that president who was elected on movie where he is against oligarchs and corruption would become uh, a real champion of fight against corruption. But unfortunately, what we see is uh, new people, but, but old nepotism. 
new slogans, but all uh, bad practices, starting from smuggling, which uh, is flourishing now even more than before, up to uh, no reforms of judiciary, no significant improvement uh, in, in, in areas like taxation or uh, money laundering uh, on con conversation, conversation of uh, VAT into kickbacks and so on. It's a whole science where you can for hours talk how our system uh, is not working. Uh, fight against oligarch uh, became really very uh, artificial instrument of political competition. As an example, uh, two weeks ago, we had uh, a, a competition for TV licenses. It became a scandal in our media because uh, from 150 companies, uh, majority of licenses were received by uh, one company, which is associated with Mr. Palitz, a junior par partner of Mr. Kolomoisky. While uh, uh, th th there are some attempts of struggling with some oligarchs like Poroshenko or now even Akhmetov, oligarchs like Kolomoisky remain in quite comfortable situation. And it seems that we will see once again a, a, a very a traditional way of Ukrainian politics when you have uh, law for everyone, uh, law, law for everyone, but friends uh, can use whatever they want. Uh, so with this, we have uh, yet another uh, reconfirmation that if you don't change the system in the first three months, uh, the system will change you and you will become an, a, a usual part of traditional Ukrainian uh, system of all your economics where uh, just those who come on the top of a state uh, machine are not changing the way this machine functions, but changing personalities which are on the top of this machine. With this, I come to conclusion of what are challenges for Zelensky and for all of us for second term of his presidency. First of all, we are entering internal political turbulence, which is going to be really very radical. We see that basically all political forces uh, are now united against Zelensky. It's only Kolomoisky and his uh, um, controlled uh, parties and TV assets support Zelensky. All the others started to attack them and accuse in authoritarian regime of governance in house, in management and so on. We see that public administration institutions are weak and unable to deliver anything significant, which means political uh, fight will only increase. Meanwhile, the second challenge is Russia and Donbass. We see the second time after April this year, military buildup at our uh, borders. No one believes it's going to lead to military conflict. A uh, small military conflict will, would, would lead to nothing. Our army is able to defend uh, uh, insignificant uh, military actions from Russian side. Serious war is in no one's interest. So we all and everyone in Ukraine is assessing this as someone's gain to increase stakes and to get something. And the last point is that economy and energy crisis, uh, which seems to be now to be inevitable with the situation uh, with our energy sphere and situation with our economy, uh, with all these three elements, political turbulence, uh, worsening of relations with Russia and turbulence in Donbass and economic and energy crisis, I am afraid that second half of uh, Zelensky presence in term will be much more challenging than the first one was. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vasil. And um, uh, I want to go now to Veronica Mochan. Let me uh, introduce her to speak about uh, economic and, and other issues in the Zelensky presidency. Uh, she serves as academic director at the Institute for Economic Research and Policy Consulting in Kiev. Her main research interests lie in the sphere of trade policy. Recently, her research focus has been on analysis of the potential impact of the DCFTA trade agreement between the Ukraine and EU uh, versus other options of regional integration. In particular, she's led projects on economic aspects uh, of uh, the EU-Ukraine relationship uh, and the impact of that uh, DCFTA on various categories of households. Before joining the Institute for Economic Research and Policy Consulting, she worked at the World Bank's resident mission in Kiev, the Harvard Institute for International Development, and has held fellowships at Stanford University as well as in Germany. And um, 
I want to remind our, our uh, listeners, you can ask questions by email, kenan at wilsoncenter.org. Uh, you can tweet them uh, or you can post them on Facebook. Although, as I understand, we may have a slight network issue, which is fine. The show will go on. The event is in any case recorded, so it will be broadcast in full. Veronica, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Vasil, for uh, speaking about some of the details that allow me to, to be brief. Uh, basically, I also wanted to follow the same logic and trying to understand what are the major achievements and probably major failures or uh, close to failures uh, in their course of last two and a half years of Zelensky test. First about major achievements, here we have uh, similar list and probably one and the major that I would say is a land reform. I would not expect that it will be an immediate breakthrough. Actually, the reform was launched just in July this year, and the reform is very much staged for the first year that only physical persons can buy land and the amount of land that can be purchased is, a, is only 100 hectares. After that, it will be the relaxation of restrictions. Uh, legal persons enter the market, still not foreigners, but the market will become full-fledged. Basically, uh, to see the results, we need probably a uh, couple of years of full-fledged market with legal uh, persons, legal entities involved before we can judge whether it was breakthrough or not. And we have to understand that uh, the legal market, uh, like uh, it's imposed on the existing shadow market. So a lot of land banks were formed before it was officially allowed. And we would, not, we would see like uh, more transparency in ownership rather than the major breakthrough. We'll see, but I, I'm optimistic that that will be a reform. I fully agree with Vasil that uh, road construction is cannot be treated as reform per se and digitalization, no, it, it will have an impact. It has an impact on the regulatory environment, although it's mainly the reflection of the life rather than uh, something that Ukraine uh, did differently or changed a lot. What else? A part of the land market, my list actually had several more points. One is NAFTA gas and bundling. It was prepared before Zelensky, but it was completed and the new gas agreement was signed on the new uh, terms, uh, which uh, allowed Ukraine to be on more like equal foot in the European market, to actually to integrate into a uh, gas market, although it did not prevent the crisis about which I suspect we will talk later a bit. And the third big block of achievements is actually continuation of economic integration in the European market. We introduced me as a trade economist and indeed it's one of the major specializations. Uh, the issue of what we have here, it's not like we have more trade with the US. It's interesting, but it's not the case uh, that is of major importance. Major importance is that we have a harmonization of standards and we are approaching to the mutual recognition of the systems of conformity assessment. We will have the common transit system. It's much easier crossing the customs. We just signed the uh, uh, common aviation area agreement, long prepared, but still moving forward here. We expect mutual recognition of electronic trust service agreement so we are establishing the regulatory interrelation with the European Union, which also in the medium or long term should allow the country's regulatory environment uh, to be much more uh, predictable. And probably half gain, half failure, the big privatization was resumed, but the first results show that without correction of actual failures, it would not bring really big international investors. It will, we will sell assets, we'll bring some uh, money into the budget, but would not make a change in the rules of the game. What is the major actually purpose of the large privatization? 
And now we turn into failures. And here I am half economist and half not because basically major failures are not linked to the economy per se. If you look at the this list, one of major deficiencies is a still lack of investments. Ukrainian level of investments is very low. It's a bit more than 10% of GDP. And we see a low inflow of both foreign direct investment, but also low investments domestically. And uh, linked to that, we see a very slow development of the industrial production over the last uh, 10 years, actually. And here we come into the investment climate and budget and business climate. And the major failure here is the judicial reform. Uh, the uh, attempts have been started, significant attempts since 2016, but so far, I would say that the problem is still there at a very large scale. I would subordinate a fight with corruption to the judiciary reform because if we have ideal institutions, but not working courts, it still would not work, uh, at least it's my understanding. So we also have some problems with uh, like increased state intervention in uh, tariff setting, the popular reflection of populist promises of President Zelensky. We have uh, uh, attacked, if not say ruined, the system of corporate government of state enterprises, not because these are scandals are the most known, but we have other cases. We have attack on the independence of national bank. We have problems with public service, with the uh, long-term absence of uh, open competitions, and also the law that allows very easy firing of people who are not loyal. And actually not only in public service, but also in the like, political, um, the composition of the government is changing so fast that sometimes I feel I lost track of that, especially at the level of deputy ministers. Plus, we have uh, intervening into public procurement. We have a recently adopted the law that brings a big chunk of public of uh, infrastructure projects outside of public procurement for Zora online system. Before we had COVID treatment, also COVID fund was not supervised by uh, under Prozora. So we have a lot of reforms that were stopped, reverted uh, uh, over these two and a half years. And that results in much slower than it could be with economic performance. Definitely we have COVID, uh, but even here, uh, the, I would not say that everything is because of COVID. So summing up my brief intervention, just say that Ukraine economically it's margin true. It's not very bad, but it's also not as good as it should be to ensure stable uh, growth and we are promised increase in that way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica. And um, I will go ahead now and uh, introduce Anna Sosia Haluchka, but uh, just let me apologize to our three panelists uh, and to viewers who will then uh, see this in recording. As I understand, the live stream on our website's not working. So uh, whichever viewer questions I, I'm able to get from uh, people who are in contact by email uh, asking about that issue, uh, I will certainly ask those questions. Otherwise, we'll just have a discussion uh, amongst ourselves uh, and the event will be recorded. And, and again, I apologize for that. Um, but the show must go on. Anastasia uh, Haluchka obtained a master's in international law at the KU Louvain in Belgium and an LLM in international public law and human rights at Tilburg University. Uh, she's currently uh, working as an expert in foreign policy and international law at ICPS in Kiev. And her focus is on Ukraine's relations with Western countries, uh, encouraging a more European approach to human rights issues in Ukraine such as LGBT plus and freedom of speech issues. Anastasia, the Zoom room is yours. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'm also seeing that the seven to eight minute uh, rule is not being a realistic thing, but that's fine because now I feel comfort comfortable in going over my assigned limit. 
uh, but I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Um, I am going to go a bit deeper because I feel like most of the big issues have been touched upon by my uh, colleagues, but I'm going to go a bit deeper into Zelensky's foreign policy and how Ukraine's bilateral relations have evolved throughout this past couple of years, especially because new president, new government, new everything, uh, you'd think that a lot of changes would take place. The hope was at the end of the day to have better relationship with uh, Western neighbors, to have an activization of relations with the EU and the US and have some sort of conflict regulation on the way with Russia. Now, instead what we got uh, is that the same problems keep persisting and the best case scenario is an unchanged situation, but more often than not, we see that the situation is worsened by time going by, which makes the likelihood of potential solutions less and less likely. Um, now, with regards to Ukraine, Russia, I'm not going to linger on that for too long because that topic has been brought up. It is very obvious that positive de development was too much to ask for, and we've kind of gotten to a dead end. All kinds of negotiations or conversations between Kiev and Moscow are basically just running into the same dead street. There is more focus on the Ukrainian side on a on good PR stunts uh, than, on, than on actually improving uh, these relations. And we can see now, as well as back in April and over the summer, that these Russian army units that have been deployed closer to the Ukrainian border um, are causing security crises over and over again. Uh, this is a constant display of strength and it's becoming this new status quo, which we actually have seen like perpetuating specifically during Zelensky's reign is that uh, it's sending the rest of the world in a frenzy. It is a continuation of Cold War antics. And we also see it continued in the relationship or the triangular relationship between uh, Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. With their, like with Russian and Belarusian joint military exercises under the name of Zapad, uh, the Zapad in 2021, which was carried out this September, we saw that the Russia's defense ministry reported at a certain point uh, that there were over 200,000 soldiers that took part in these exercises. Once again, it's all about showing military strength. Whether or not there were seriously 200,000 uh, troops involved, that's a questionable thing. But at the end of the day, everyone agrees on the fact that this is a threat to regional security and clearly also responds to joint NATO, joint NATO exercises in the region, just like we're seeing right now happening uh, in Eastern Ukraine again. Uh, and in general as well, if we're looking at Ukraine-Belarus separately, those relations have been very chilly, if not frigid, since last year's protest in Minsk, which led to Ukraine rolling out the red carpet basically for Belarus refugees, voicing solidarity with the protesters, which very much angered uh, the status quo, the authorities in Minsk. Now between Ukraine and the US, that other big international player, we see that um, Ukraine and US relations have not recovered yet from the awkward diplomatic embarrassment that happened with Trump in 2019. That, that separate situation say already had put Ukraine on the back burner of US foreign policy. And despite all the wishes, but also what we at the ICPS predicted, it did not get better with Biden elected. Uh, we can call these relations relationships frosty at best, um, and considering what had happened and considering what Biden's family relations are to Ukraine, considering the entire scandal that the U.S. press also rolled out uh, with regards to Burisma Gate, I think uh, it's safe to say that Biden cannot even look at Ukraine without Burisma being mentioned in the U.S. press again. Um, so we do not see that changing anytime soon. Additionally, this year, lifting sanction, sanctions against the Nord Stream 2 pipeline was been, has been a huge blow for Ukraine. Um, although, of course, there are other legal developments that have led to the de facto uselessness of this pipeline, like the German court ruling, uh, that, the, that the Nord Stream 2 is not exempt from EU competition rules, and uh, basically saying that there is almost no way for it to guarantee that Russian state-owned uh, gas can go through that pipeline at the end of the day, the act in itself is still really seen as a betrayal and it really touches as well on Ukrainian sentiment towards uh, its Western partners. And if you go to Washington, and I've, I've seen this when we were uh, in Washington visiting you and I think it was January, 2020, 
uh, somewhere right before this entire COVID uh, thing hit us. Um, we could see already back then that the general sentiment uh, was very heavily so that the US supports Ukraine. Like, of course we do. The US is a very big fan of Ukraine, but to actually, but it is a, it is a sentiment that's very much limited to words and there is no political, there is no political space or room for anything else than words rather than action. Now, in light of this, uh, it's also important to mention that, of course, last summer, we had this amazing meeting of President Biden and Putin in June, which sent a whole ton of mixed signals to Ukraine, um, despite like very obvious tensions. And I think we can all remember Biden's outburst at the press conference afterwards. We still see that there is a certain agenda for some limited U.S.-Russian cooperation because at the end of the day, the U.S. also has to pick its poison. There are new threats coming on to the international, uh, into the international arena, and the U.S. has already previously stated very clearly that it is, at its best, a wary of China, uh, and it has to pick its poison because you have to pick either Russia or China. You can't fight them both. And for now, China does seem to be the bigger threat. And on the one hand, that makes the Ukraine problem less relevant because we have other things to figure out. And on the other, uh, it also causes Russia to become a more needed partner. Now, uh, formally, Kiev and Beijing, as their like, separate bilateral relations, are considered to be strategic partners under an agreement that was signed in 2011. Now, what this strategic partnership exactly means is up for interpretation. Uh, it is very unclear. However, we see that that partnership is evolving and it is getting more and more uh, interdependent, more and more economically bound to each other. Uh, and the relations actually, the, the involvement of Ukraine-China relations are very much dependent on this sort of Pentagon between Ukraine, US, EU, Russia, and China itself. So if US, Russia are getting an amelioration in their relationship and that relationship gets a boost, it might lead to Ukraine actually turning to China for uh, like for, for some solace, I guess, for economic cooperation, uh, and especially because the short-term benefits uh, for Ukrainian Chinese uh, cooperation do outweigh or are the only thing that are being seen rather than the long-term negative effects. And with that, I mean, if you look at China's neo-imperialism or if you want to call it neo-colonization or destabilization of young democracies in the Pacific region, these are not things that Ukraine is very worried about, whereas it's very clear to something that Australia and the US and Western Europe are getting more and more wary of. Um, lastly, in this regard, I have to say that this year as well was the year that Motor Speech once again became a headliner uh, and it had put Ukraine in a very difficult position, in a very uncomfortable position. And we have to say that the US reaction to this whole debacle ended up kind of caught stirring a certain uh, huffing and not really, I would say almost defined reaction from the Ukrainian side at the thought that their affairs can be meddled with uh, by such a global partner who on the other hand has no interest in meeting Ukraine in other, in other demands or requests that they're sending forward with regards to uh, the war going on in Eastern Ukraine. Now, with regards to the EU, we see that with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, uh, it has been a clear message sent to Ukraine that Germany's interest in Germany's economy is more important than Ukrainian security. Uh, even though we have from a German side also kind of a pledge or a promise to negotiate a 10-year extension of the Russia-Ukraine agreement on transit gas, uh, this is not something that is a legal obligation for Germany. They can easily get out under of that of that promise of that obligation they've taken upon themselves. Um, so it is giving them a lot of space to maneuver, whereas it's, put it, whereas it's putting Ukraine in a tight spot. Uh, and we also see hand in hand with those frustrations coming, to, like coming, to, Ukraine is coming to the realization that we are still so far from meeting the standards for EU membership. This is being repeated again and again by EU leaders. And a point that's also been made by, by um, Ned Price of the US Department of State with regard to NATO membership in Ukraine, we're so far off, it's not going to happen anytime soon. And it's not giving a lot of encouragement to uh, the Ukrainian leadership right now. 
And it's been very clear, there, there have been very clear signals sent that meaningful negotiations with regards to EU accessions are not, uh, are not in the cards. And then the last that we see is that with regards to the EU as well, we have these border countries for Ukraine, which are Hungary and Poland. Zelensky started his presidency with a very, um, I would say tight or, or, or negative relations between Ukraine, Hungary and Poland, which is a shame to be honest, because as much as uh, we have a, a big threatening, I would say, uh, country bordering, uh, bordering us on the Eastern side, the last thing we need is looking or picking fights with the West. But um, there's a multitude, I think, that plays in that regard. Well, first of all, it's the accusations of Russian influence in the governments of Hungary's and Poland's, uh, in, in Hungary's and Poland's governments. If you look at uh, Orban and Duda, they're both not very pro-EU right now. These countries are experiencing problems within the EU because of their conservative policies. And Ukraine's relationship with both countries remains neutral at best, hostile at worst, because of conflicts over historical issues and language issues. And additionally, we see that last uh, recently, we had a diplomatic conflict bursting out again between Hungary and Ukraine. Uh, when, uh, when Budapest actually made a decision to sign a long-term contract to purchase Russian gas, something that hit Ukraine in its very core, and it considers it to be a blow to internal economics and national security interests, which send a back and forth, I would say, uh, a back and forth fight between ambassadors. Now, um, to round this all up, I think that the main emotions that we can see right now from the Ukrainian side are a certain level of a peak, actually, even in frustration and distrust towards Western partners. These consistent war scares that are putting the West on edge um, are, are, are influencing the entire security sphere in the region. And we also see that Zelensky, Zelensky seemingly is unable to rally the necessary support from Western partners to kind of tame Russia, uh, to force it to back off. Uh, and in the meantime, while this all of this is happening and these relationships are kind of crumbling. We see Ukraine also engaging in bilateral relations with China, seemingly without a clear strategy, seemingly without a good understanding of what the risks may be. Uh, and it is kind of the sentiment of our Western partners don't want to help us. They uh, just want to use us for their own gain. That sentiment has been strengthened in Ukraine throughout the past two years. So I hate to I hate to have this negative outlook on the future. I hate to be the pessimist of the group, but I think that in bilateral relations, after all, the concept of Ukraine fatigue has officially set in, which is something that we have been warned about, I think, around two, three years ago, and that Zelensky sadly hasn't managed to combat. And I am not one uh, to be this pessimistic, but I don't see that change anytime soon. So yeah, thanks, Matt. Thank you very much, Anastasia. Um, I, I have to say the term Ukraine fatigue, which was very much in vogue for many years in uh, the U.S. discussion about Ukraine, it, it really did seem to go away for a while um, and was, of course, replaced by crisis, the Ukraine crisis, the Ukraine crisis, the war. Um, but to see the idea of fatigue returning while the crisis continues, it's... Um, I agree with you, it's a very pessimistic reality uh, and I'm not happy to see it. Um, in any case, uh, again, I, I um, want to apologize that we don't have the live uh, viewer questions. We, we do have some folks emailing. So let me start out going right to the, the theme of today. And I want to make this a question for all three of you, um, if you can offer some brief thoughts on it. Uh, you know, Zelensky is uh, a symbol. He occupies the office. Um, uh, sometimes with presidents, you know, uh, it becomes uh, the term, the name becomes the term for a period of history, you know, the Zelensky years, the Poroshenko years, the Kuchma years era. Um, but let's talk about Zelensky, the person. Uh, this is a very unique person. I mean, uh, this is, you know, one of a tiny handful of actor comedians ever to be successfully elected to uh, the top office of leadership in any democracy in the world. Uh, it's certainly the first time in Ukraine. Uh, it's extra unusual because he actually played a president on television. Um, and I think there were a lot of predictions that had to do with essentially this 
unique kind of populist style and this unique moment of bringing everyone together and so forth. But it seems to me in so much of the discourse about Zelensky for the last two and a half years, we just treat him like any other politician, you know? So my question is, is that right? Is he just, has he become just like any other politician? Uh, or what are the unique ways in which uh, the, the features of this man, this, this, this unique person, have translated into some kind of change uh, in the way that business is done in Ukraine, or, or is there none at all? So who would like to tackle that question first? Vasil, please. I presume it's my part of cake. Um, yes, actually, it's exactly what everyone uh, noticed how people changed their uh, perception and attitude to Zelensky. If three years ago, he was definitely different. He was absolutely from another world with an image which he imposed on us from his movie. It was not actually a uh, human being, Vladimir Zelensky, citizen of Ukraine, actor of Quarter 95. It was uh, an image of President Holoborodko from his movie. And we all thought he would come and transform the country in a way how he promised in the movie. And what we all experienced uh, these two and a half years it's absolutely different personality, absolutely different way of behavior, treating of people, uh, starting from uh, his entourage in office of the president up to uh, usual normal people on the street. Uh, and I think the final uh, point here was the story with offshores, which he used to accuse Poroshenko and others. Offshores were a symbol of uh, elite which is uh, not paying taxes in Ukraine and hiding money in, in, in foreign safe heavens. And when Pandora papers were published and Zelensky was uh, on first pages of international media as one who also uh, did the same, basically comment was everywhere, wow, what's the difference? What's the di it's not just, uh, is it crime, not crime? doesn't matter. You pretended to be moral authority for, for nation. You pretended to be a leader of a new Ukraine, uh, uh, someone who would be embodiment of new generation. And when you see what is happening, well, what's the difference? Basically what people are saying, it's they quote what Zelensky once uh, said, talking about languages, now people use his quote about uh, politicians, what's the difference between them? Uh, but what worries me more, yes, uh, it would be very naive to expect that he would come and transform the country just because he played uh, a, a president in his movie. It was obvious that he cannot change the country without state apparatus, without public administration, local bodies, constitutional reform, and so on and so forth. It was basically dream, impossible to do it uh, with usual, usual ordinary instruments of public uh, policy. Uh, but what worries me more is that uh, he seems now quite clearly even less prepared to the job than we would expect before he, he took the post. He, was, he is over emotional. He reacts very emotional on er, every critic. He is using uh, instruments which presidents may not use to uh, attack his enemies. He is rather uh, very, um, I would say, not law abiding president, so to say. The way how he is using uh, a decrease of uh, national security and defense council is softly saying not in line with our constitution and our law, uh, a body which is just advising according to our constitution just became as the highest court of the country, uh, allowing to judge citizens without proper justification, even with mistakes. A recent uh, uh, acknowledgement that 120 persons were included into sanctions by National Security and Defense Council by mistake, 
uh, the story with actor who was just mixed with another one uh, playing in Russian uh, movies and was included into sanctions is just showing how unserious is uh, using uh, public institutions for imagined effective uh, actions. And it's getting not just one of uh, by uh, side results, it's getting the key instrument of his uh, policy. It's getting basically the only instrument he seems to uh, have learned over the last two years uh, to use uh, in order to influence society. Uh, and it's basically uh, from his way of uh, perceiving uh, politics and working with people. Simple one-step decisions. Okay. Tell me come to a point and what to do. Just one step, not really building consensus, not really uh, looking what is uh, legislation. Simple uh, decisions uh, which uh, might then play very badly for not only our state, but for him personally. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Vasil. Uh, Anastasia, please join in. Thanks. Um, I think what I want to add to that, one, like the last thing that I want to add to what Mr. Sudichuk said, because he is right, is that um, Zelensky started out with an incredible amount of credit with the Ukrainian people. Uh, as much as he seemed like an unlikely candidate, he was the underdog, he had so much trust in the people, and this trust persevered again in governmental elections, in the parliamentary elections, and I think it took him over all this time, it took him two years to run out of that credit, and he did run through it. He ran through it by firing his ministry squad again and again, by, by sending it by a four eve of the pandemic, totally unprepared, unprepared. He made multiple mistakes. He came to the international arena multiple times with empty hands and, and again and again proved that he was repeating Poroshenko's mistake, even though he very hardly criticized him on his foreign policy with that, repeated um, mistakes of his predecessors. And, and, and I think until the very last moment, I think until two months ago, I would have told you that at the end of the day, the overall sentiment, I think in Ukraine would still have been that He's a good guy. He's just a good guy who might not be really exactly professionally ready for the role, but like he's there and he's trying and it's the Ukrainian institution that is against him, but he's fine. But indeed, I think that the, the, the papers that came out last month, that that kind of thing actually was the, the death nail to the coffin. That's where it stopped. That's where the credit ran out. Um, and I think, I don't know if he's going to be able to recover from this, but from what I can see now, being a couple of weeks down the line of that of that scandal, I I think it's very unlikely that he will ever gain. Obviously, he will never gain the same approval rate back that he had at the very beginning. But uh, it, I think that he's kind of reinforced that cynicism in Ukrainian people, which I think is a big shame. Let me uh, turn to you, Veronica. Um, you know, I, I want to know: do you, do you agree with what's already been said? It's a pretty negative assessment of how he has done. Uh, you know, transferring his skill set, if you want to call it that. But let me add very specifically this question: in the last same same two months, in which he's been suffering from the Pandora Papers and whatever else, he maybe is also held responsible for the energy crisis. Um, do you think that's fair? Uh, uh, let's probably start from what your first question and then go into the energy crisis. Uh, basically, yeah, yeah, I'm not in a position to treat him personally, but I think uh, we, we should look at his staff. He has a position, whatever his background, he, can, he, he had some roles to do and he had uh, some laws to obey and he had the tools and he should have a vision. And I fully agree with Vasil and Cecilia that what we see is not what was like promised and the picture that was built. But energy crisis, um, maybe it, it's hard to say exactly because it's a combination of factors. What we mean under the energy crisis? First, we have the external shock. We have very high uh, gas prices, which 
there's a mixture of factors from Russia to climate change and uh, post-COVID recovery and China. It's, it's a huge complex issue. We have, and for gas prices, uh, he is not responsible, but he is responsible for meddling for, uh, for intervening actually into the uh, NAFTA gas management, uh, which probably, I'm not sure, but it, I think it also affected the performance in the company over the summer, then the gas stock had to be accumulated. Uh, plus, if we have uh, the prices would not come in Ukraine as sharply if we would have enough coal stock. But here again, we have intervention, maybe not him personally, but uh, like uh, the, we, we do not see a normal performance of uh, coal stock accumulation as it should have been. And it is related to the politics of this process. So I would not, and plus we have uh, all of the usual problems that we rely on some energy supplies from uh, Belarus, we rely on energy supplies from Russia, and here we also, here we quite expected they also have problems. So I would not say that he is like personally responsible for this crisis, but uh, the erratic economic policy that we observed and the source of which is largely on Mr. Zelensky or his office or jointly uh, definitely contributed to the depth of the crisis. And we are, I'm not sure how uh, good will be the resolution. Definitely we will, might be lucky if it will be warm winter, we can go through the crisis. But if we are unlucky from like, the, uh, from like external, absolutely external sources, the management of the crisis is very questionable because the previous shocks show that uh, this uh, team is not very strong in crisis management. Thanks very much, Veronica. <clears throat> I wanna come uh, back to Vasil and uh, Anastasia as well um, on uh, kind of a political, um, tactical question, perhaps more than a security question, because I think um, when it comes to NATO, uh, Ukraine, as has been said, has received a lot of um, attention and assistance and training and joint exercises and so forth. And yet Zelensky made a very specific choice several months ago, maybe, maybe a year ago or more. He really started to push hard on membership and membership action plan. I think harder than any Ukrainian president has pushed. Um, I, I'm not sure it got a good reaction from uh, European and, uh, and North American leaders, but, but maybe arguably it's, it's why they're, they're getting so much attention now. What do you think about this? Was, it, was this tactically and strategically wise or not? Well, it all seemed like a sign of, of uh, desperation. Uh, we all expected Zelensky to have a new, fresh view on our foreign policy. Certainly not to repeat uh, the same statements and rhetoric as Poroshenko. Uh, the way that he just continued usual Poroshenko rhetoric was very strange. But when he started to become, as I said before, Poroshenko hard version, to be even harder on nationalistic agenda, to be even harder on the issue of uh, um, uh, EU and NATO accession, it really uh, seemed like either he is provoking NATO to say no, and then to turn back and say, okay, you see that they don't want us uh, to accept, that's why we turn back to Russia. It was one interpretation among his critics. Another one was that he is just desperate with no response. That's why he decided to uh, show how uh, arrogant, cynical uh, are our Western uh, partners while showing signs of support. In reality, they don't want to accept us, at least to remove responsibility from his shoulders that uh, it's not his uh, lack of 
political will or diplomatic efforts, which led to a bad situation in our foreign policy direction. At the end of the day, it just proved once again what you mentioned before. Um, there is either lack or maybe both lack of um, skilled people around him who whom he listens to, uh, or either uh, unwillingness of these skilled people to explain president sometimes unpleasant uh, uh, circumstances in which he uh, has to decide and accept unpleasant possible uh, consequences of his statements, letting him to make mistakes after mistakes, which then just strike back. I think both are uh, both both explanations are are true, and the worst thing is that we do not see changes in his foreign or internal policies after a number of similar mistakes took place uh, half a year ago or even before. We see that it repeats and repeats and repeats. So it seems like a style of management, and I I, I pray that maybe the second uh, part of his term he would make some changes and would listen to those who say him not only pleasant compliments, how great is our president and how uh, everyone is applauding his um, another video uh, or, or, or speech. Um, he must turn back to reality, whatever difficult it is. Anastasia? Yeah, I think what I want to add to that is that um, remember when Zelensky was running so and and constantly what we saw on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. God knows if there was TikTok back then, he would have used TikTok, all these video reels, all these gags, all these, all these funny ways to integrate young people in the decision making and, and engage them just in politics. And I think when Zelensky came to power and said, I'm going to fire the old guard, like I'm going to implement my own young core group, we're going to be like this new generation, nobody connected to like the, the, the established Ukraine political system. We're going full out. Um, I think for me, for example, when he announced that, I thought, oh, we're going to see innovation. And I think that's also the point that Mr. Fiduchuk is making that we haven't seen that much of that innovation. What is the point of firing the entire old guard, bringing in this entire drum of new, young cool kids from the blog if you're not going to do anything with it and with regards to the nato question i honestly and maybe this is not uh my colleagues won't agree but i honestly don't think it was the worst move because indeed you absolve yourself Zelensky made a, a thing that i see like this mistake that i see way more in happening in ukraine or in eastern ukraine in eastern european countries than i see in western european countries which is starting out your campaign with promising things that you have ne are never going to deliver. This NATO membership, it's not yours to promise. Like it's, it's just, you can, you can try and double down on efforts, but the explicit promise that you make of EU membership, of NATO membership, it is not a one party kind of deal. And I think in this context, the only way he could have not lost faith is by maybe making, roughly speaking, kind of a fool out of himself on the international arena by pushing this hard. I think he definitely didn't come across as the most refined diplomat we have ever seen. Um, but on the on, a, like the, on the domestic level and the domestic sphere, I think if anything, it's a way to say, mea culpa, I washed my hands in this. I've done all my best. I know that I promised, but look, it's not my issue, it's them. Um, but Adding to that, though, I also want to say that one of my big, I guess, disappointments with, with um, Zelensky and Ukraine's foreign policy right now is as well the fact that I think we very urgently need to revise our diplomatic core and what our diplomats are doing, because I have this feeling that Ukraine diplomacy is not working nearly as well as it should be, considering the precocious state that Ukraine is in and considering how important uh, that organ or that institution can be for for ways of support that may not necessarily be black on white uh, javelin missiles or whatever, but that can have more or bigger effects in the long run. And I think that's something that our current government and previous government are overseeing and are glancing by and not paying enough attention to. Let me, um, I, I, I did get a question via email uh, from one of uh, our colleagues who was not able to tune in live. 
Uh, Blaze Anton from TCW um, asks a number of questions, but I, I want to ask um, three of them together here and let you each comment on them. Uh, they're related. He says, what does Zelensky believe in? Halfway through his term, and I still don't know what his priorities are. Um, the incoherence of his actions seem to make it hard to understand him. For example, in spring 2020, he fired the well-regarded governor of the Central Bank and replaced him with an inexperienced, largely unknown uh, executive. You, you've commented, of course, on uh, the, the, the constant shakeups. Uh, both Zelensky and his new central bank governor had recently expressed a preference for weaker currency and lower interest rates to support growth. But then the new central bank governor presided over a series of interest rate hikes, and the currency is stronger today than the day he was appointed. The change in central bank governors contributed to significant delays in progress with Ukraine's IMF program. Was this just Zelensky's inexperience, or was there some purpose for this personnel move? And finally, why does Zelensky change his cabinet so frequently? The ministers seem to have very little influence over policymaking. Does he fire and hire as a way of signaling to the population that he is a man of action? You, you've commented on, on pieces of all of these issues together. I want to go to Veronica first, because the core of this question, of course, is about the economy. But I let you other, the other two comment as well, please. Uh, thank you. Very interesting question. And I will be grateful for the Silver Anastasia comments, because it's half economy, half politics, basically. The priorities, uh, it's hard to understand. The, it seems that economic policy is more like reactive to the current challenges rather than there's a clear priority. We have some priority commitments and moves, or for example, related to our association agreement. I, I mentioned some of them, but this is quite tactical. Uh, on the macro level, uh, I would, we have a lot of strategies, they even developed strategies for 2030 with a lot of right things. We have uh, just recently committed uh, to uh, participate somehow in the Green Deal that creates additional uh, issues related to sustainable development, green transformation. So we have a lot of plans and priorities, but I would not say that I see really like one or two clear cut things and persist and move on that. Why, why the governance of the National Bank was changed? That was a surprise for me as for many others, I suspect. Uh, for me as a macroeconomist, I would say that the performance of the new governor uh, was quite okay, basically in line with what the national bank policy, declared policy, it means that the increases in interest rates is a correct response to growing inflation. The consumer price inflation is already 11% this year and it's climbing up and the producer price inflation as global prices boom, we actually have 57%. Uh, just recent figure, it's, it's, it's enormous. And I would not expect the uh, responsible national bank governor to uh, continue stimulation through policy rate uh, in this situation. And especially taking into account that the policy rate is a lot of responsibility of the government to say it's a uh, collective decision. But the rumors actually are that this governor might be changed again. And this is, for me, the most um, disturbing news on this uh, whole situation that uh, the governor that was expected to be like uh, having softer policy in line what would president declare, he continued the uh, lines of the national bank policy according to all its documents and international commitment. And in a year, it seems that the president is unhappy. But these are rumors. I don't know whether everything, anything will change. So, and yeah, basically, I would say, uh, yeah, I turn, looked for term mildly school uh, than preparing for this uh, meeting. And it's, it's like coping with a crisis without clear strategic planning or something like that. And Maybe 
not exact definition, but that's how I understood it. And this is the economic policy in some cases. We are responding to the crisis. Uh, we are responding to situations, but not like persistently moving forward. And basically, from my point of view, because Ukrainian economic development, economic uh, like performance, depended not on the how good the economic policy per se, but on politics, on the rule of law, because I think that the major, major issue is that the people, uh, investors, do not trust domestic foreign, do not trust in the economy because of this shake up in the, in the government, because of very frequent changes in rules, because, for example, we are in November and we still do not know whether the plans for major changes in taxation be adopted this year to become effective January 1st or not. This huge level of uncertainty uh, coupled with unexperienced, after, I don't know, after two years, the, the team that is emotional, using the same word, uh, create uh, many problems. That's my vision. Um. I can offer you, Vasil or Anastasia, a quick comment, and, uh, and then I'll go on to a couple more questions before we end. Vasil, please. And as someone who knows our president personally very well told me once, uh, he believes in his luck, in his star, and in uh, himself. Uh, he doesn't believe in uh, reasonable alliances, consensus of interest, balance of uh, different groups of uh, influence. That's why he encircles himself only with loyal people. And you are under either under him as his servant or you are enemy away. And it answers the question on Smolii, uh, former governor of Central Bank. He has never been part of uh, Zelensky team. They never trusted him. They demanded him to make some actions which he refused. And it was not the reason, it was just pretext. He was not part of their team. Look what they do. They change people like, like uh, actors, uh, cards of actors. They choose one a candidate, plays well, bad, throw away another one. Uh, so uh, that's the reason how they changed uh, and why they changed ministers. Uh, they do not really understand necessity of, of institutional uh, memory, of institutional capability of, of uh, the public bodies. They just play with this, and it might be one of the key problems of the Zelensky government. Anastasia, did you have a, a comment on this? I have nothing to add to that. I think most of it has been said. Okay, great. Let me do a final round of questions. My colleague, uh, Mikhailo Minakov, uh, has suggested a question for each of you. Um, so I will start with Veronica. Uh, President Zelensky pays a lot of attention to his landmark project of big construction. Can you assess the impact that has had on Ukraine's development as well as the distribution of power and resources? Yeah, great question. Thank you. Basically, last in 2020, the uh, spending of money on uh, public spending on construction was one of the factors that allowed the GDP reduction to be not as large as expected. It was not the major or only factor, but that also definitely contributed. Also, as I said, uh, we had a dark side of that that, that was outside. Uh, the uh, online public procurement, and we had scandals regarding the, uh, how money was spent last year, and uh, I, I suspect that we will see some more investigation to come. This year, the, uh, uh, the construction continued, but as we see in uh, GDP figures, it, it's, it's not helping a lot. Uh, to ensure a boom, and I here uh, agree with the assessment at the beginning that it's nice, it's pleasant, but 
it's not what would change the economic uh, performance of the country. Also, it makes him uh, personally quite visible. Thanks very much, Veronica. Um, the question next to Basil uh, from uh, Mikhail Minakov, how would you assess Ukraine's security today in comparison to 2019? Is Ukraine more safe or secure? Uh, does it have stronger allies? Um, is there more perspective on reintegrating Donbass and Crimea? Um, and I think because it's a related question, I'm actually gonna add uh, Misha's question uh, for Anastasia, and then I will let you each answer uh, the same question and, and give it as your final thought. Uh, to Anastasia, he asked, you listed all the countries with which Ukraine has conflicts of various kinds, but can you say something about Ukraine's major allies today? So I'll let you each, I think, comment on that. Basile first, and then Anastasia, you have the final word. Well, first of all, uh, Ukraine really improved its security capabilities immediately at the beginning of Russian invasion. And till now, it remains um, sufficient for any uh, dealing with any of small scale invasion. Uh, is it strong enough to withstand serious uh, invasion? No. Is it sufficient to uh, deal with serious destabilization uh, efforts which we might face in upcoming months, very, very doubtful. Uh, without socially uh, strong society, with all these endless rumors, even discussions about military coup d'etat, some weeks ago, there was a wave of discussion in, in Facebook about, oh, maybe there will be a coup d'etat, and some people were making jokes about it, some very seriously discussed about it. Wow, uh, with, 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 with such kind of uh, even jokes, uh, you, you can't really be confident that your security apparatus uh, is functioning well. Moreover, uh, as we mentioned before, talking about corruption, we see that uh, security service of Ukraine prosecutor office are back to their usual uh, practices of uh, combining official duties with uh, covering businesses, smuggling, and so on and so forth. So, uh, I would not assess security uh, potential of Ukrainian uh, law enforcement bodies as very low, but certainly they are not as we need them to be, and they are not sufficient in case of major uh, risks or threats. Concerning reintegration and uh, return of Crimea, unfortunately here uh, we see more clarity. And clarity is not positive, but negative. There is even less uh, willingness uh, to make practical steps uh, to reintegrate Donbass as it used to be one or two years ago. Appointment of new vice uh, prime minister for integration, Madame uh, Varishuk, uh, is a kind of uh, manifestation that no one is going to do anything with this. No one is taking seriously at all this agenda. So for the moment, it seems that Zelensky decided not to take this risky, dangerous issue on his shoulders and to make any significant step to uh, 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 renew implementation of Minsk or to propose some actions which would unfreeze uh, situation or return us to uh, at least basic ceasefire, sufficient ceasefire, or moreover, uh, bring us to serious uh, negotiations on peace settlement and so on. So uh, for the moment, I think we are in wait, wait and see mode for at least half a year or maybe even more. And then we have elections, unlikely he would take it uh, before elections. And what will happen after elections, no one can now predict. Thanks very much, Vasil. Uh, Anastasia, I'll give you the final word, but let me ask you to help us end on perhaps a slightly more optimistic note and make sure to include Misha's question about friends of Ukraine. Can you talk a little about that? I feel I feel uh, I feel attacked <laughs> for my pessimism, but no, it is a valid question to be fair. Um, 
And um, I, and it is actually a, a great way to kind of point me back uh, to point out the obvious to me and to everyone involved here is that the, the issues that I mentioned, the countries that I mentioned, as much as I may have focused mainly on the biggest downfalls and the greatest pitfalls in these bilateral relations, except for Russia and Belarus, obviously uh, the other countries that I mentioned, yeah, like we are talking as well about Ukrainian uh, close partnership, Ukraine's friends. Specifically, if you look at the Baltics, if you look at Poland, if you look at the majority of Eastern European countries, we see that their interest in Ukraine's stability is greater because of geographical reasons, obviously, but also because of this common, maybe post-Soviet sphere loyalty sentiment. Um, if you look at Lublin, for example, they have come up this year, I think it was this year or late last year, with the Lublin Triangle on economic, political, and military cooperation, which is also very clearly um, stating its support for Ukraine. Uh, Poland is, I think, one of our biggest um, one of our biggest supporters within the EU, when it comes down to regional security, they are the ones that are, um, and from the conversations that I had back then with the uh, MFA in Poland, they are the ones that are coming up for, for Ukraine the most. And I keep pointing uh, the Ukrainian issue, or not the Ukrainian issue, that's a tired term, but the Ukrainian-Russian uh, relations, uh, the tensions, the war, they keep pointing it out within the within the EU itself, within the EU institutions, and they speak for Ukraine when Ukraine can't. Um, with regards to China, I think the economic development is an interesting route for Ukraine to go on. It's also impossible to not engage with China. Uh, China has very clearly stated that they're interested in the in the Silk Road initiative and that they want to. They haven't planned concretely out yet which route they want to take, but either way that Ukraine is going to be part of it is, is basically uh, a non-negotiable fact. Um, and I think that China can be a very valuable partner to Ukraine uh, and that there is a very promising future for these bilateral relations. But obviously, I, I feel that from Ukraine's side, there has to be a bit more um, intent uh, clear intent and knowledge on, on what they're doing and where they're heading and how they are guiding these relations instead of rather than just being guided by their partner. And obviously, uh, Western Europe and the US, despite having kind of slowed down, I guess, in, 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 the, in the friendliness or, or kind of have cooled down, those relations are still, I think, Ukraine's biggest, uh, I, Ukraine's biggest support the fact that the anti-Russian sanctions are being maintained or upheld for the most part, and even in some levels being being pushed forward, being being pushed for, for tighter grip. Uh, it's a difficult diplomatic, I think, work to, to get through it and to ensure that, that the right people are targeted in the Kremlin. But um, I think that uh, if we could manage to exchange uh, information in a more effective and efficient manner that these relations would even bloom even more and we would be doing a better job at uh, upholding effective sanctions against Russia. So I hope that was kind of like on an optimistic note. I really think that the possibility is there for better cooperation. It is a thing of, I guess, having uh, being reinvigorated on an international level after a tiring pandemic has slowed all of us down a bit. But the, the future is there. We can, we can definitely do it. I believe so. Well, thanks very much, Anastasia. And, and thank you, Veronica and Vasil, uh, for the discussion. I have to admit, um, listening to the three of you, reading uh, what I read about the state of uh, the Zelensky administration in Ukraine, I actually feel quite a lot of empathy for this, this guy because uh, it seems like he gets hammered. He gets attacked whichever direction he goes, uh, he shows, you know, sort of too much showmanship, too much kind of new leadership. And, uh, you know, he disappoints people. And then he just says, hey, I'm just like everybody else. And then he's just like everybody else. And he gets punished for that. And he lets the international partners dictate the terms too much. And he gets in trouble for that. And then he demands things from them. And he gets in trouble for that. Um, but it just reminds me that, you know, hey, this is a really important job. Politics is a very hard game. And as someone once said, uh, I think about the American president, um, there are no easy decisions. 
because if the decision was easy, it would be taken by someone below the level of the president. And I think this is probably true in Kiev as well. Um, you guys have all helped us to understand some of those difficult decisions, whether he's got them right or he's got them wrong. They're his decisions to make. Um, so thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you to uh, my colleagues who were able to supply questions. My apologies to those who couldn't join us live, but all of this is recorded and will be on our website very shortly. So enjoy listening. Thank you so much and uh, be well, everyone.